Yeah. 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 That was a good one. And and, and we were completely pissed. <laughs> Actually, no, As you would be in Poland, you yes. can't not be. I was stone cold sober. I yeah. had right. eight. I had eight Stalin's tears. <laughs> Is that what they were called? <laughs> It's like the Anton Deck of the Amiga community now. Or is it the Muppets, the old boys? Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's more like it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that David represents the, uh, the, the classic Amiga. Right? And of course, I'm the young next generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we like to talk about. We, we, I mean, obviously David was in Commodore, was the managing director of Commodore UK, and in those days I was a mere you know, user of Commodore computers. Uh, but we, we like to talk about our shared passion about Amigas. Although I have to say, he never had an Amiga computer. He never, he never even turned one on, did you, David? No, the, the sad, that stat sad truth is. And I, I did a back of the envelope calculation one day to estimate how many computers I'd actually personally sold, not my team, me personally. And I reckon I've sold about 2.2 million computers. That's from PETs to VICs to 64s to... I, I think I've like 1.9 million of them. <laughs> yeah, right, whatever. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is that in all that time, I never turned one on. Hard to believe, but it's swear to you, it's the truth. But you know, there is some real validity in that, and that is that I don't believe people can naturally um, be, be uh, two people. And I think if you are a technical person, you have technical understanding, it makes it very difficult to be a good marketeer. Because what marketeering does is it sells the idea of the benefits that a product can bring you. Whereas the technical side of it is how it does it. So. My success in selling was completely based on, on that premise that I presented products in a way that people could understand. And a good example of that was the Batman pack. When, when that, when, you know, we, we estimated we'd sell 10,000 pieces of that because we presented it really well and it showed everybody what that piece of plastic with keys on could do for you. When we ended up selling 186,000 of them in 12 weeks, we knew we'd got it right. So what I'm saying is that uh, I think my ex my expertise in marketing was, was helped by the fact that I'm technically a dumbass, and I still am. It's quite, you mentioned the Batman pack. I think I was speaking to someone today who, whose first computer was the Amiga Batman pack. Yeah, there we go. So I said I have to introduce you to him. So there you are, I should thank David. Yeah, well, he, he, he did. <laughs> he came over and said hello before. Yes. Um, you know, we, we, I think last time we were here, we talked about uh, some of the things that you were involved in in Commodore. Uh, there was a lot of interest about uh, your attempt, your f eventually failed attempt to acquire Commodore. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought today maybe we can go into that in a bit more detail. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and just you know, highlight some of the things that were good and bad about that and, and how it kind of soured you towards the, the industry after that. And you can go through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the truth of the matter is that the success that Commodore UK actually had, um, we believe should have been the benchmark for the rest of the world. Um, and the fact that the Commodore management refused to uh, acknowledge the success and make the other subsidiaries um, follow suit. Um, so when Commodore ultimately went bankrupt, Colin Proudfoot, who was my co-MD, he's a financial guy and a, and, a, and a financial wizard. We sat down and said, you know, surely we, if we could get hold of this, surely we could do something better with it. And so we sat down and, and we spent months and months and months, days and days and hours and hours, devising a business plan. And the business plan was so powerful that in 1994-95, we raised $50 million from investment. You try and do that today. It's very, very difficult to do that today. And the reason is that um, the business plan that we put together was a very comprehensive one. 
And um, if, you, if you'll indulge me, I'll give you an overview of what that business plan was, what we planned to do. Because I think, I think then you'll get a, a, um, a realization of just how tragic it was that we weren't able to do what we wanted to do. Anyway, our business plan um, comprised of a, a number of sections. The first section was that as far as we were concerned, we would have really nothing whatsoever to do with CBM and PCs, and we'd have nothing whatsoever to do with the, the trademark Commodore, except for one way. What we planned to do is that we planned to, to license the, the logo CBM. The CBM at one time was as powerful as IBM. And so what we wanted to do was to license people who manufacture PCs um, in their own right, license them to use the name CBM. Now, what the one thing that we had, we had an amazing distribution network throughout the whole of Europe. Commodore was in every retail store that you can imagine. And that's a fantastic grounding before you start. So our plan was to have a, we would be based in the UK, we, would, we may even actually, we were planning, we may even set up uh, in Ireland because there's tax advantages for that. Um, so that's just an aside, it happens to be true. Anyway, what our plan was, was that with the name CBM, we would license it to a manufacturer of PCs and they would pay us a royalty for every machine that they sold, a very modest royalty. And all we would need to do would be to have our own team of, of um, quality control assurance people to make sure anything that went out with our name on it was up to scratch. And that's not an expensive operation to run. Now, in addition to getting a license fee for every machine that was sold, because there was loads of manufacturers out there who didn't have a name and they'd love that. But in addition to that, we could then turn around to most people and say, look, oh, by the way, we've got a sales team that are going into every retail store in Europe, and if you would like us to, we can sell on your behalf your machine and get commission for it. And on that basis, we could then take orders, send the orders through to them, they would manufacture the product to order and deliver it to our customers. We would have no cost involvement in that at all. It's revenue generating. We were going to do exactly the same thing with the name Commodore. Our plan was to allow licensing the badge and the name Commodore on virtually anything with a plug on it. Toasters, kettles, hair curlers. It didn't matter. Because the name was a very good brand name and it was accepted in all the retail stores. So the idea was, again, license it. Make sure the quality control is right. And, uh, and also offer to sell it, our sales team would sell their products and we would earn commission from it. Now that's a revenue stream with very, very little expenses. No manufacturing, no hauling inventory, nothing like that. That in itself is a very, very powerful message, a very, very powerful business plan. As far as the Amiga was concerned, that was what we were going to concentrate on. But we would also license the Amiga name for things like clothing, fashion items. Because again, everybody wanted to buy you know, Amiga t-shirts and all those sorts of things. So we do exactly the same thing with that with the Amiga. Our plan for the Amiga product itself was we had already had designed and built um, a tower case, which was designed to um, be able to accept any motherboard from any model of Amiga from 500 up. And that anybody, and we would then by using the, the, the independent dealers, I'm not talking about the, the, the multiple retailers because they weren't capable of doing it, but the independent dealers, we're gonna give them the opportunity that people could come in and upgrade. They could change their, their 500 motherboard for a 1200 motherboard, keeping their peripherals and so on and so forth. So we'd already designed a case. And in addition to that, we were gonna make sure that any new model that we produce would fit inside the PCB, would fit inside the case. And we're also going to sell motherboards on their own. There's a first. And why not? People have invested already, they've got lots of peripherals at work, so we would sell PCBs on their own. This whole project was called Amiga Infinity. And the idea being that we would keep going as long as we could with the current technology. 
However, you must remember that um, that technology would eventually be superseded. And so our plan was by not having, we're not building PCs, we're not building 64s or any of those sort of things at all. We're only involved in Amiga. But what we also had that was part of the package that was on offer from the Commodore was the technology that was being developed um, at the time. And that was a, a, a project called the uh, codename Ombre. And what this was, this was a, an HP RISC based core that had built into it a 3D rendering engine, a chunky planar mode, um, 5.1 surround sound stereo, which was state of the art at the time. And all I can tell you is, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing on the market today that comes close to what this product could do. And the tragedy is that when ESCOM bought it, they just let it go. They didn't follow it up, they let the engineers go and end all. So our plan, of course, was to produce a whole new range of, of um, Amiga products, but they would not be backwards compatible because you can't for something that is so far advanced. Anyway, basically the, the whole p position was that we used um, Coopers and Lybrand, who are very famous people, um, who were, um, had they've got great experience and great success in, in supporting management buyouts. And together, we, with the business plan we put together, um, they pulled in um, some wealthy individuals. Um, they pulled in one organization that had an investment um, uh, fund. And between them, they, were, they come up with $25 million. We also then um, met up with a, a, a Chinese manufacturing company called New Star Electronics. And they, they had up until that point in time, they'd been ripping off Sega and Nintendo machines and selling them into China and not paying any royalties to anybody. But they'd been told by the Chinese government they've got to get legal. So they approached us and they agreed to invest the other $25 million. And that would have been a perfect match because that would have given us an investor shareholder who was also a manufacturer already with their foothold in the Chinese market. And remember, our business plan did not have any any mark, any business plans for sales outside of Europe. Europe. So that was an absolute bonus to us and, and actually a perfect match. Um, the, the, the problem was that um, 48 hours before the auction of, of Commodore um, took place, we had done our, we'd done our homework and we, re we recognized that we estimated that the, the assets would probably sell for about $15 million. And we were pretty close because it ended up being about $13 million, so we were pretty close. But what we had to take into account, and this is what ESCOM didn't take into account, was that we knew we could not start manufacturing and get credit terms from all the suppliers of components because it had all just been burned by Commodore big time. So we knew that we would have to fund ourselves for the next, well, we worked out seven months, we reckon after seven months of trading, they'd start giving us credit terms. So when you do all the numbers, we knew in order to buy the assets and run the business successfully for seven months, we needed $50 million. So what happened is that right in the last 48 hours before the auction, uh, new Star Electronics were were stolen away from us by Petro Dechenko, representing ESCOM. He said, oh, don't pay them $25 million, we'll give it to you for free. Complete and utter lie, they never intended to, and they, they ditched them immediately. But the fact of the matter is that even though we still had $25 million, Colin and I, there's no way that we could commit to buying the assets when we knew we'd run out of money. We'd run out of that $25 million before we were self-sufficient and therefore everybody's money would be lost. So we had to make the painful decision to actually not even bid. So that's the whole truth. That's the absolute truth. Uh, God is my witness. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, uh, the question is that, uh, that people always ask, and you know, we've thought about it and we've discussed it ourselves, is if you had a... You know, let's say it's gone through. You know, what if? What if you'd acquired Commodore? Do you think that even with the new technology coming through, the way the world was changing, the way the world has changed with uh, technology, that you'd have had the resources ongoing to actually 
keep developing the business? Well, obviously we believe so, and uh, and certainly our investors believe so. That's how can we raise the funds? I think the thing the thing is that we were we were talking about scaling down an operation and running it from a, as a small entity um, and and only spending um, funds for things that were necessary. But we believe very strongly in R and D, and that's something that uh, Commodore had been strangling for years. They've been you know cutting, cutting, and cutting. And but the worst thing about Commodore was that they would they would have a head of head of engineering, and he would get this engineer developing this and another engineer developing that. And then the next thing you know, that head of engineering is gone and a new person's come in. And that person goes to the first one and says, what are you developing? Oh, I'm doing this. I don't do that. Throw it away, start this. And this was kept happening all the time. And if you read the book, Beth Richard, she's done a, a whole chapter in the book about that, the number of things that were developed and then not released. And that's, that's tragic. So in answer to your question, we believe by the concentrating on what, and also, of course, the big thing is that we always ask our market what they wanted. The number of products I received in the 12 and a half years with Commodore that were sent to me to be sold, and nobody ever asked the question, does anybody actually want this? And a good example of that is the plus four. Perfect example of that, right? Going back then to you saying about developers and development and concentrating on specific projects, I mean, all of the development was happening, I guess it was happening in Germany, but particularly in the States. So you're going to be a, a European-based or a UK-based company, and you had no developers unless you got from the US or Germany. I mean, did you have plans to get quite, oh, yeah. bring some of the, the, the key people? Yeah, no, no, I mean, we would have an operation in the US, but only a very modest one, we, you know, as much as you, if anybody ever saw the Westchester place, it was massive. And why would you have a big place that was a distribution and assembly plant and all of that when you've got no market in America? We had no business in America. We had a little business. And again, it's in the book, but I mean, we, it, Commodore, was, with the be, Commodore Inc. was the best sales prevention officers I've ever seen in my life. We had no distribution. We had no retail channel because they screwed it up. But we would build it as and, as and when we could, but we would certainly would have research, R&D, and if they happened to be best in the US, then it's fine, that's not a problem. It's not a major expense, but it's an important expense. Uh, well, I, I have to disagree with you. The development is a really major expense, and, and very expensive people. And of course they can jump because you know, they're in great demand. So I think we'll disagree on that one. But, but I, it, it, it is, I mean, I, actually putting a percentage of your revenue towards development, I mean, that was a, you had to do that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm also interested that uh, we, we joke about things from time to time. And, um, I, I'm thinking back to uh, some of the stories you, you've told me in the past. Now, uh, most of them in the book, but there are some stories that are not in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any little juicy tidbits you think you can reveal in front, on camera uh, that are not in the book? <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I don't mind if you, you don't mind, but. Um, I mean, there's one very funny story. A lot of people don't know that um, Mary Alley, who was um, our uh, illustrious leader, um, he... Just one thing. That if you've ever seen the, uh, the homage to uh, um, the Abbey... Not Abbey Road. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I was thinking about something else, right? Uh, it was the we did a in 2010 to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Amiga, we did a, a redo of oh, of the Beatles album cover with all the people. Uh, Sergeant Peppers, uh, we did the Sergeant Peppers, and on there I I, I did Medi Alley as the Grim Reaper, <laughs> <laughs> and on his on his scythe there was a bone ball and a Commodore, a Commodore Chicken Legs logo. <laughs> That's what I remember that, so yeah. go. Yeah, anyway, um, what a lot of people don't know is that in spite of um, uh, the attitude that Medi Ali all seemed to have towards me all the time, which was almost antagonistic, um, he obviously had high regard for us at Commodore UK because he sent his son, Medi Ali Jr., to be an intern with us. So he was with us for almost two years. And anyway, he was a um, quite a nice young man, you know, unlike this dad. 
And um, anyway, the time came and he had to go back, uh, in, and I think he was going to university somewhere. And so we decided we'd give him a farewell party. And um, anyway, I left it to uh, one of my guys, Kieran Sumner. He said, I'll leave him, I'll organise it. So we went to a pub that we used to go to fairly locally. And all I knew is that the next thing you know, there is, he, he'd organised a granny gram. A granny gram. This old lady came in. It was revolting in every respect you can't imagine. And um, she started. She's to, probably quite tasty now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she 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 had a she had a face like a wrinkled prune, you know. I mean, but um, anyway, she came in. She came in and and, and started to um, you know do this erotic stuff around Mediani Junior. And she got to the point where she's taking her clothes off and she lets these things sag down here like you've never seen in your life, I swear to you, right? But then get this, she then said, um, she said, you ain't seen nothing yet. She said, wait till you get a whiff of my rancid muff. I swear to you, word for word what she said, I mean, that, it makes me cringe even now. You know, in, in the modern world, we can't say those words, right? No, we're now so politically correct that that is a terrible story. I'm glad it's not in the book. <laughs> it is true, I swear to you, it's true. And you should have seen Betty Ali Junior's face. I mean, we all cringed. It was absolutely awful. I couldn't think of anything worse to have done to him, Paul. There's one story I like, and it, I, I think it's in the book, but it's, and you've probably told it before many times, but I like hearing it. And it's really the cheeky one, the, the cheeky uh, Sega one. I think that's a oh, great right. story. Yeah. Does everyone know this, the story about Sega? It's a gay Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the, basically what happened there, you see, I, sometimes there is a God. I mean, I was I was forced, absolutely against my, my will, kicking and screaming, I was forced. To, to launch the CD32 about seven or eight months ahead of its launch schedule. Now that was wrong for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was that I knew it would kill all of our 1200 sales because he want, many wanted to launch it pre-Christmas for additional revenue. And I tried to tell him, you're never going to get additional revenue. All that's going to happen is that people who were buying the 1200, and remember we had orders but every 1200 that we could make was ordered and booked, ready to go in for sales in the, in the, in the UK market. I said, not only that, but we, at the software, we had, we had put uh, development kits in every one of the major software houses, and they were developing specifically for the CD32, so that when we had the official launch, which is going to be late spring, early summer, we'd have good software ready to launch with it. Anyway, he would not listen. Absolutely refused to listen. So um, my marketing manager, Dawn Levac, she's wonderful. She managed to get us into the science museum where we did we booked and uh, do the launch, and we booked um, uh, Chris Evans, who uh, has been at that time he was sort of an up and coming broadcaster, he's been on television all the time. He's, but so we, we're very we're very cute at, at getting people who who were going to become big stars. Anyway, about two weeks, two or maybe three weeks before our scheduled launch, the launch was the 16th of September, and I chose that date specifically because our, our launch platform was 16 will never be the same again because of the 32 bit thing, right? Anyway, about two or three weeks before, there was an article in, in a, mag a PC magazine where Tom Kalinsky, who was the worldwide president of Sega, was interviewed. And one of the questions he was asked by the interviewer is, what about CD-based 32-bit consoles? And he said, can't be done. If anybody could do it, it would be Sega, can't be done. And that was three weeks before we were going to launch. Thank you, God. So what happened is that um, we did a voice for the launch. We did a voiceover of somebody pretending to be him speaking and, you know, and, and announcing that. And then, of course, we opened up the curtains with the smoke and mirrors in here. Oh, and by the way, it's going to be in your stores in the next three weeks. You know, so it was phenomenal that way. But things sometimes happen without reason. And, and about a week or two later, 
guy rang me up and he said, David, you're not going to remember me. He said, I remember you. He said, I came and we did some business together. He said, uh, he said we've got poster sites all over the country. And he said, you, you, you know, you've walked our poster sites before. He said, boy, have I got a deal for you. He said, as you know, when you book a poster site, you pay 50% deposit. And then when it's time to do them, you, we invoice you the other 50%. He said, I've got three prime sites in London that somebody's already paid the 50% on and now they're cancelled. And I'm offering to you for the 50%. Oh, and by the way, one of them is right outside Sagan's head office. <laughs> I swear it's all true, I swear to my life. So anyway, I'm not sure who it was, but it was somebody in our agency who came up with this thing, you know, Sega's advertising on television all the time was to be this good takes ages to be and then they said to be this good and they spin the word ages around takes Sega very smart so if somebody in our agency came up to be this good will take Sega ages <laughs> <laughs> because it said so so we, we were legally entitled to say because it was in print from the president of the company, you know. No, I mean, those sort of things don't happen very often, but wow, but it was brilliant. So, so on that, so on that uh, big poster, it was outside their offices. Yeah. Now, the unfortunate thing is I can't find any good photographs of that. I've got photographs, but they're very blurred and not very high resolution. So if everyone... Well, there's one in my book. It's in the book. It, it's, yeah, but it's still from that same photograph. It's still, it's still the same picture. So if anyone's got, you know, whether it was in a, ma yeah, no, I think it's just taken from a magazine. So it's, it's not as, the good quality. So if anyone can find a good quality version of that photograph, please let me know. So the interesting okay. thing is, though, is I remember there was no internet in those days, but that went viral. It was all over the world, and everybody was raving about it. I mean, I think it wasn't really. To having the balls to do it, it was the fact is that they gave us the permission to do it. They actually said in print that they couldn't do it. So anyway, but as a, as a continuation of the story, a few weeks later, um, every year in, in the UK, we used to have an industry dinner called Indian, surprise, surprise, at which, at which we used to raise money for charity and it was be everybody getting awards and all that kind of thing. It was nowhere near as big as, as you know, the, 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 the big American awards. But it was our industry thing. And anyway, we were all there, and uh, it was the Gloucester Hotel. We used to hold it in the Gloucester Hotel. And I'm there, I think I've got three tables with my staff. And um, were Nintendo are there, everybody, Sony's there. And, uh, and sure enough, there was Sega. And I knew um, the MD of Sega UK, Nick Alexander. Anyway, so he comes walking over to me, and God is my witness, and he said, um, a bit close to home, Mr. Pleasance, a bit close to home. And I said, yeah, well, you know, where needs must, where needs must. And never another word was said. He was seething. They were furious. But it was true. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> now, I could be wrong, but didn't Steve Franklin die recently? Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. Do you have, do you have any sort of memories or thoughts about, about Steve in the time of Commodore? Yes, Steve, Steve was a... Um, a very charismatic character and when he took over as MD, as my boss, um, I can remember like yesterday he comes storming into the offices, we didn't know him, and he said, right, he said all the business, uh, business division, everybody in the business division in, you know, in this place now, at which point in time he, he fired all of them except for two people. He fired, he kept, the people he kept, we kept um, Kieran Sumner because we'd, by then we'd got the Amiga 1000 and that was Kieran's baby. And obviously he's, he didn't know anything about the Amiga. And the other person he kept was a guy called Peter Talbot who was our education guy. He, he was doing a really, really good job. And he got rid of everybody else and brought all his own people in. Uh, he, he was with, uh, I think he was with Granada before I was in. So he brought all his own team of people in, including sales managers and the whole lot. He, what was your position at that time? I was, I was um, a national accounts manager for consumer products. And anyway, he did not speak to me one word for two weeks. Not a word, not a hello, kiss my ass, nothing. So he comes in this Monday morning, Pleasance, my office now. And 
sat down and he said, right, he said, I just want to tell you, he said, if I knew anybody who understood anything about your side of the business, you wouldn't be here today. Well, thanks a lot. You know, that's great. He said, no, he said, I've got nothing against you. I don't know who you are, he said, but I've been brought in here to change the whole ethos of Commodore. I don't know why, because we were doing much wrong. Anyway, he said, so, seeing as how I'm stuck with you, here's my rules. And then he spouted off all this about, you know, integrity and honesty and loyalty and all these things, everything which is right through me. And I said, Steve, I've got absolutely no problem with any of that. I said, I'll tell you what, Steve, I'll make a deal with you. And he said, you're in no position to make an effing deal with me. I said, hear me out. I said, I'm gonna, I'll put a proposition to you now. If you, if you go for it, I'll either bring you more business than you've ever seen before, or I'll give you enough cause to get rid of me. What do you want to do? I said, Steve, look at that. And I pointed to an Amiga 500 on his desk. I said, what is that? I said, that is a piece of plastic with some keys on it. I said, it is very hard to market a piece of plastic with some keys on it. I said, so I've got this idea. From now on, we don't sell computers, we sell dreams. And that was the start and, and, and of, of the uh, whole idea about the Batman package, the first one we did. And um, anyway, um, what I can say about Steve was that he had the balls to go with it. And this, it was so successful. I mean, we, we made, my team made him a hero because we, our business went up and up and up and up and up. And he had the balls to go with it and, and I've always respected that. The sad thing is that I subsequently found out that, um, uh, I mean, I thought he was there in that position as MD forever because he's a young guy and he was doing really well. And I had the opportunity to be promoted to um, general manager of CEL, Commodore Electronics Limited, which was the holding company for the whole group. And my role based in, based in Basel, Switzerland. Okay. Yeah. And we were based in Basel, Switzerland. Why? Because it was, you know, tax. Another story. Anyway, um, my responsibility there was looking after 35 countries, countries where Commodore did not have an operating uh, office. And for me, that was bliss because, you know, there are two types of salespeople. There are hunters and there are farmers. I'm a hunter. I'd love to get out there and find business and grow it. And I'm not a farmer. Anyway, because I, I didn't think uh, Steve would be going anywhere soon, I applied and got, got this job, and I was really, really happy. Only a few weeks later, I got summoned to New York in front of Medi Ali's office, in front of him, and he said, what do you know about um, this, uh, this company? I can't think of the name now. I thought for a minute, I said, oh, I said, aren't they the people that we've just appointed in the UK to do all of our servicing? All of warranty work, and, I, and he, he says, "What do you know about them?" I said, "Absolutely nothing." I, I'd heard that, you know, I, just, I remember the name, but you know. all right. He said, "What do you know about X, Y, Z?" And I said, "Oh, yeah, I know them. They're the company that do all of our hospitality. You know, we would take our best customers to Wimbledon finals. We'd take them to Prix de la de Triomphe, um, and all of these sorts of things. And every time we did, we always walked away with a swag of orders. It was the way you did it." Anyway, we used a company that arranged all of those things. And so I told him about that. And he said, well, what do you know about it? And I said, what do I know about that? I said, the company is run by a guy called John Shaw. And John Shaw was previously the commercial director for Chelsea. So when Commodore UK signed the Chelsea football deal, which at the time was the biggest shirt sponsorship deal ever, it was 1.25 million pounds. John Shaw was the guy in charge. Subsequently, he left and set up his own company doing all this hospitality. Anyway, it turns out, because I was able to convince many that I didn't know anything about these companies, it turns out that Steve had a financial interest in these companies and was therefore getting a return from the business he was giving them, which is highly illegal. So anyway, Medi says to me, right, well, just for your information, Steve Franklin's no longer with Commodore, he's gone. And then Medi said to me, I want you to take over the UK. He said, I know you built the business, I know who did it, so I want you to take it over. I said, no, I don't want it. What do you mean you don't want it? You know, 
I said, I don't. I said, I'm a hunter and you've just given me the best hunting job in the world. 35 countries. I love travel. I love doing it. I'm going to build that. I want to keep it. Anyway, so sadly, Steve passed away. Uh, but I, or just as a, as a bit of more to that story. Um, ultimately, when uh, when we had to declare bankruptcy in Commodore UK, which we were last, we were 14 months after the parent company, we had a duty to we had to follow, and I had to make a decision as a director: do we threaten to prosecute Steve Franklin for this because there's money involved, and we had to do the best thing that we could for our creditors, and I reluctantly had agreed that we would try to prosecute them, but come to a settlement. So that they pay, because he, he, he got a lot of money out of this. So uh, reluctantly, I, I had to say yes. So even though you know we've been very, very close, um, I, I had no other choice. I had to do what was right by my fiduciary duty. And so we never ever spoke again. But anyway, sadly, I found out that he, uh, Steve passed away in, on uh, New Year's Eve um, of cancer. So very, very sad indeed. Um, it might be a good, good idea now to open up the forum to questions. So, any questions you got for either uh, Dave or myself? Anything you want, we'll try and answer. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I'm in Dublin, I've been 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 in Dublin, i have uh, it's all bound up and it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the I, I looked through it, it's pretty boring to be honest, because it it is actually a business plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Very comprehensive. Yeah, yeah it's really comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, that question was do, do we have a copy of the business plan? And, uh, as Trevor explained, wow. Colin Proudfoot, my co, co MD, uh, he has a copy of the original plan. I didn't keep mine. I don't know why, but anyway. Yes, sure. you Nice holidays. 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 Because I, I had a personal interest in destroying the ST. And the, the reason, well, the, well, for obvious reasons, but for more reasons than when I. And that's what ruthless. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, business is, as Jack Jamil said, business is war. Now, but what happened is that um, when I first joined Commodore, um, and then after three or four months, I was moved into the consumer products division. My boss at the time, the, the sales manager, was a guy called Paul Welch. Now, he didn't like me, and the reason he didn't like me was only because he wasn't allowed to choose his own staff. Commodore had a policy that every now and again, they would not let you recruit somebody from outside, you'd have to recruit somebody from inside. And it was perfectly logical for, for me to take on that role because that was my background, I was always selling into retail. Anyway, he didn't like me for that reason. And um, so we had a few run-ins, And but in the end I got my own bag and I got him fired. I got him fired because he was, my customers hated him. He used to lie to them and, and you can't do that. Anyway, cut a long story short, after him, he set up his own software distribution business and did a few things, but the next thing you know, Jack Jamil has bought Atari. Um, Paul Welsh was close with, with a, guy, a guy called Bob Gledo, who was Jack Jamil's right-hand man. So Paul Welsh ended up joining Atari. So there I'm, now I'm in a situation, I can't do anything that, well, we had the Amiga 1000, because they wouldn't, wouldn't compete with the ST. And once we had the 500, we had something to compete with the ST. So I thought, right, there's a lot of ways. You mean compete on price? Well, well, yes, could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the 1000 and the ST were never a comparison, as, as you know. 
But anyway, once we had the Amiga 500, we had an opportunity. And I, so I come up with a concept that I've always believed very strongly that independent dealer is the people to get, you know, which is why uh, Amiga Infinity was going to be done through the independent dealers. They're much better, they're loyal, and they know what they're doing. So what I did was I, I introduced a marketing plan where I gave a percentage of, of each, I had five distributors, one of which was an Atari distributor, SDL. They also distributed Atari. But I had five distributors, and what I did was I gave them a marketing allowance, 2% of their purchases. They had to match that from their own money, 2%. And what we did was that we gave every single Commodore product a number of points. And we said, right, for every Commodore product you sell, you get X number of points. If you reach a certain volume of points, we're going to take you on a really fantastic trip. And the very first trip we ever did was actually to Mexico. We went to Mexico City in Acapulco. And what I can tell you is that when we were in Acapulco, we stayed in the Acapulco Princess, which at that time was in the top five hotels in the world. We really laid it on. And of course, I think from memory, there was about 36 dealers who went on that trip. But what they did was, of course, every time somebody went into their stores and said, I want to buy an ST, they'd say, no, you don't. You want to buy an Amiga because they were getting points, right? Now, we, you multiply that. So it wasn't because the Amiga was better than the ST that we said. No. <laughs> I'll leave that to your own discretion, what you believe. But the point I'm trying to make is that it was a marketing plan specifically designed to allow the dealers to sell my product and make more, make more out of it. And we absolutely killed the ST because every, we, our dilemma was that once we started doing this, we had to keep finding better and better places to send them. So we, we went to, we, one time we went to um, Singapore and then Hamilton Island in, in, in Australia. And then I think we did Bermuda and uh, all these different places. But when these dealers got back from the trip, the first thing they did was call all their mates and say, you don't know what you missed, it was so fantastic. And so everybody got onto the bandwagon. And it's just another marketing ploy. Um, but I think you can see that how, how, how powerful that was. Did it replay anyway? I'm sorry, replay it anyway, back to it. No. No, nothing. No. Nothing. I mean, it would have been a real compliment to me if they had. <laughs> but, you know, but look, you think about the things that we did. We did all the packages. We did Batman and all that. And did you see our straight away, all the other companies follow suit. Nintendo, Sega, they're all putting packs together. We started it. That's a compliment to us, if you think about it. Sorry. Your the best word of memory. Yeah, yes. Any other questions? Sure, yes. Since uh, the time that Pedro acquired uh, Commodore, uh, did you thought to cooperate with them? Did you discuss I, I, something like that? I, I, the, the question was um, after, uh, um, I suppose, Escon acquired uh, uh, the Amiga's technology, uh, did uh, David and, and Colin uh, think about cooperating with them. Uh, you can actually talk about uh, Manfred Schmidt, I guess. Yes, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in fact, um, what, what a lot of people don't know, of course, is that Commodore UK was a, an entity in its own right, Commodore Business Machines UK Limited. And so when it came to the time when we had no option, but we had to liquidate the company because we got we used every, as every other subsidiary went bankrupt, we got all their stock and kept trading in the hope that we would end up manage and buy it would work and we would then carry on from there. But one of the things that Commodore was very good at, the structure of it was it was founded in the Bahamas, registered in, in uh, Switzerland where I was based for a couple of years, um, listed on Wall Street, but everything they did was all about tax efficiency. And what they were very good at is what's called transfer pricing. Now let me explain how that works, and this is very relevant to the question. Let's say, for example, Commodore UK would buy an Amiga 500 from Commodore International, or Commodore uh, CIA, Commodore International Limited. And let's say, as an example, we paid $200 for it from our parent company. We would then sell that product it would say retail at $400, but from that you take away the warranty, marketing, 
margin for the retail and so on and so forth. Now, if you're buying something and you're selling for 200 and you're making a profit, eventually you end up owing tax. So the way to overcome that is that suddenly I'm not paying $200 for it anymore and, and, and selling it for $400. i am suddenly paying $400 for it and all the stru everything stru structures all stay the same. So that meant I was losing money on everyone I sold. And by doing that, it means that you end up with tax credits because you're losing money and not making money. So every time it swings and roundabouts, they would just pay the end. So instead of the UK making the profit, the parent company makes the profit. It's what they call transfer pricing. It's highly illegal, but it's what a lot of people do. Now, at the time when we were getting ready to, to liquidate Commodore UK, we actually had six million pounds worth of tax credits. Was losses you'd made because of the transfer pricing policy. Yeah, so yeah we're not we're not yeah. lost money at all. But it looked like you had, right? And so, so anyone acquiring your company could actually, well, if they did it right, they could acquire those tax losses. Yes, and yes. they made profit. They yes. got sent against the losses. Yes, yeah. indeed. So Colin and I went to to meet Manfred Schmidt, who was the uh, head of uh, Escom, and we said to him, look, you know, we really think you should buy Commodore UK as a going concern. And uh, he said, yeah, I'll do that. He said, but I'm only going to do it uh, if, if I and Colin stayed with the company. And neither of us wanted to work for him. And um, Colin said, no, we, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, so Manfred Smith said, well, in that case, then I'm not interested. And he said, he said to Colin, how are you going to feel when you go back and you're telling all your staff they're out of work? And Colin said, that statement is exactly the reason why we do not want to work for you, because that's just, that's who he was, the personality was, and so it didn't happen. And they were stupid. They were so stupid because you imagine they could have traded probably twenty million dollars dollars worth of, of business and not pay any tax on it because of all the credits we had. Now, obviously, uh, the ESCOM era was really short-lived. I mean, they, they, they bought... Uh, Too long. Yeah, it was, it was about a year, wasn't it? And then the bottom fell out of their PC market, and they, they'd overextend themselves with buying Rumblows and Silicas yeah, yeah. stores, and, and it, it was very quickly, it was, it was you know, gone, really. And nothing... I suppose they did restart the 4000T and the Amiga 1200. Projects. I mean, rebuilds, um, but it, it really nothing happened after that. And I guess you, after you walked away from the deal, after it fell through, I guess that was it, the end of the, the story with Commodore and Amiga. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I, was, I felt very battered and bruised. We'd spent months building, uh, designing, and, and uh, writing the business plan. We'd got that close to it, and then to get cheated out of it was just a bit too much for me and so I just I just left the industry, I went under the radar and did all sorts of things. I went I opened the studio which is what that CD is about, a recording studio, I did some music and then I ended up remarrying and I went to live in Australia, I bought a restaurant, I ran it for five years and everything changed. And then of course, um, out of the industry all that time and suddenly I get a, a, an, an email from two of the people that are here, um, that's um, uh, uh, Marvin um, and uh, Marcel Frankenay sent me an email saying, we're doing Amiga 30 in Amsterdam, will you come and be a VIP speaker? And uh, that was a real shock to me, I had no idea. And I, I, I got on stage, I can't even remember what I said. I really no idea at all. But then suddenly I'm back into the scene again, and suddenly, um, and my whole world changes again. And, and, it's, and it's an amazing feeling. If somebody had said to me in, say, 1991 or two, you know, one day you walk into a room and people would be saying, can I have your autograph, please? I'd have said, what the hell are you on? You know, because you can't imagine, 30 odd years. I'm gonna take some credit for the book, actually. Right. No, well, one thing, it's got a fantastic forward. Oh, <laughs> That's that's very forward of you. Yeah, two pages. Well done. Uh, two pages. Very nice. Ah, hello. 
Before that, um, uh, I used to I was write a series in Amiga Future magazine uh, and, uh, called Classic Reflections. And uh, I had, yeah, uh, called Classic Reflections. I'd never, you know, I, I was running out of uh, topics to cover, companies, but I'd never co covered actually Commodore UK. Although I had done a, another series called Amiga Retrospective, which really dealt with the whole Amiga scene. Um, but uh, I thought it'd be great, after I met David at um, Omega 30, I thought it'd be great to do an interview with David and Colin, and they agreed to that. So we did a two-part, a really long interview, two-part series, and I think that was one of the reasons you start, you start thinking about, well, I might write a book, and it's kind of kicked off from there. So I take a little bit of credit, not a lot really. No, the truth is I needed the money. <laughs> I still haven't got it yet, but you know. But I, I, I think the book's pretty good because it, it does reveal a, you know, a lot about the, the t your time at Commodore. It does miss out a lot of um, spicy stories, which I guess you, know, you really couldn't really put in there just because of you know, potential um, issues down the road. Uh, and, and I think these shows are great when there's no cameras around or recordings because you can then have, you know, you have a few drinks and you can get some of those stories. So if you're around tonight, uh, you buy David a few drinks, he starts to tell the stories that he can't prove. Yes. <laughs> uh, can I just say that um, I need to give some thanks too, um, because Marcel Frankenay and, um, uh, and, and, and Paul um, Kitching helped me design the, the cover of the book, which I'm incredibly proud of. I think the book cover is amazing. And so I really need to thank them. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but also, I've got I've sold out of books today. I'm really sorry, those of you who wanted one. But I have got the Blu-ray there, and the Blu-ray consists of about an hour of interviews um, uh, with me, and then we've also put into there um, a documentary all about Jack Tramiel, because my involvement with Jack Tramiel was virtually non-existent, because I joined in June of '83. I, I met Jack for about two minutes in, at the CES in Las Vegas in January 84 and within a few weeks he'd left the company. So my, my retrospective about Commodore does not include Jack, so I thought it was you know, very worthwhile so on the Blu-ray when you've got so much more room. I uh, put included this uh, documentary which is done by uh, Kim Justice. Oh, Kim Justice, not not Stephen. Not, uh, Stephen no, no, it's uh, Kim. It's Kim Justice's own one, and um, and she's done a thorough, thorough job. And and, and so I think you find the whole documentary that she's put together about forty five minutes is very interesting. Having said that, um, uh, Leonard Tremiel thinks it's a little shit. That that interview that she that documentary that she's done. He, he commented on on, a, on one of the posts that, um, that it's all bullshit, but I don't know. What, what would I know? If you haven't seen the Commodore story uh, by Stephen Fletcher, that's uh, uh, quite a good movie. It actually does have a quite big section about Jack Tremiel, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it's Leonard Tremiel telling yeah, it about Jack. Yeah, it yeah. Is, it's, it's Leonard, Jack's son, talking about Jack, and but it does go into the history a bit more, and it tells a few things I didn't know. Yeah, that's all. Anyway, the, the Blu-ray is on sale at the moment. It's 15 euros if you want one. They are selling for 20 pounds um, normally, so it's a good price. No one needs a few left there. And I've also got the CD, which was the, the original recording I made to start the uh, comment when I bought when I set up my studio. It's um, uh, it's called Everybody's Girlfriend, and it's a, a really it's a um, a tribute to 10 years of the Amiga. Uh, it's all live music, there's no computer music in there. I, I personally don't like computer music, I'm sorry those of you who do. But when you're a real musician, you only like live sound. And that is, um, that's, uh, all the tracks are live. And, um, uh, and, and the interesting thing was that when we didn't know anything about our target audience when we produced this, uh, um, except that they were an Amiga on it. So what we've done is we put all different sorts of, all genres of music on there, all different sorts of things. There's, there's one track on there that is actually me playing. I composed a track and recorded it, and it's in, uh, uh, in honor of J, uh, J Minor, tribute to him. Um, and, and there's all sorts of styles of music on it. I, I think most people have got it, I think, really enjoy it. Um, 
Um, I'm doing that for five euros today if you want it. So uh, there's only a few left, but um, yeah, come and see me if you do. Uh, and if you want a book and haven't got one, just get on to downtimepublishing.com. That's my my uh, website, and you can order it, and then I can ship it to you. I think we've uh, run out of time, uh, but I'd like to thank Dave for you know, being uh, honest and open as he always is, and telling it as it is. <laughs> and if you haven't read the book, it's, it's well worth reading. So thanks very much. Thank, thank you, guys. Thanks. <laughs> Он стабилизатор это раз. Бицепс мажор на целый тиждень это раз. А мы сейчас лайв зарабатываем. I'd like to get a picture of everyone so we can all gather around. So uh, we can do the yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 So can everyone sort of gather around in the middle? Let's make a fire hazard. Torch oh. oh. Uh, so what we'll do is, you know, we'll come over there and we'll get someone to take a picture of us all. Because uh, this is, uh, actually this is even bigger than last year I reckon. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit like the, the movie Jaws, we're going to need a bigger room. <laughs> So we're, no, we're all, we're all going to stand over there. there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we'll get someone to take a photograph. So, come on, everyone get in. Come on, squeeze round.